The Proto-Indo-European culture is the ancestor of most of the cultures from Iceland to India. It's something everyone from those cultures have in common. It's our shared heritage, lying behind our societies and uniting them. Understanding it will not only tell us about our own culture then, it will show us what we share with others. Even though the Proto-Indo-European culture broke up 5,500 years ago, we can reconstruct a lot of it by looking at the different cultures descended from it. We look for shared patterns in the languages, in the beliefs, in the social structure, etc. And through seeing what they have in common, we can reconstruct where they came from. Among the things we can reconstruct are some of their deities. In some cases, we can reconstruct both their identities and their names. In others, their names are beyond recovery, but we can still reconstruct their personalities and characteristics. In this video, I will be talking about those Proto-Indo-European deities we can reconstruct with varying degrees of confidence. I won't be giving everything we know about them or how they were reconstructed, since there isn't time for that here. If you're interested in knowing more about them, I recommend going to my website, a link for which is in the description, or referring to my book, Deep Ancestors, which can be purchased through my website. It's highly unlikely that these are all the deities the Proto-Indo-Europeans worshipped. Indo-Europeans were enthusiastically polytheistic, so the number of deities they worshipped was probably quite large. However, the others have been lost, or if they have survived, have done so only in one or a few cultures, making them impossible to identify as Proto-Indo-European. The gods can be reconstructed more confidently than the goddesses, probably because they were less likely to be identified with geographical features. Some of the goddesses would have stayed behind with those features when the Indo-Europeans moved around to where we encounter them. Also, there was a tendency for the Indo-Europeans to adopt some of the deities the people who lived where they moved, and this was especially the case for the goddesses, so many of them that survived into historical times are originally non-Indo-European. Of the deities, Deus Pater is the best reconstructed in name and in functions. The most obvious examples of his descendants are Jupiter, Zeus Pater, and the Vedic Dyaus Pater. Other traditions preserve the first part of the name, such as the Germanic Tibas, while the Scythians, the second part, as Papias. His name means Shining Sky Father, and he is accordingly a god of the bright daytime sky. Since his name comes from the same root as the Proto-Indo-European word for god, it's no surprise that he was the chief god of the Proto-Indo-European pantheon. Unlike his famous descendants, Jupiter and Zeus, Deus Pater wasn't a god of thunder and lightning. They got that from the Near Eastern chief gods. After all, it doesn't make any sense for a bright sky god to be connected with storms. As a chief god, Deus Pater is connected with the natural law, the cosmic order behind all things, which called weird in Old English and Rita in Sanskrit. In Proto-Indo-European, this is called the Khatos. Deus Pater doesn't establish the Khatos, which is laid down by the workings of the universe. What he does is enforce it, and his decisions, constrained by the ultimate law, are therefore perfectly just. Going along with this, Deus Pater is a god of oaths. As the god of the way things should be, Deus Pater is naturally god of priests, whose actions are intended to correspond to divine rules. Deus Pater may be appealed to for clear thought and law, and accordingly, he is a good patron for judges, lawyers, government officials, and scientists, especially physicists. Chayamein gets his name from an abstraction, which might be translated as usness. He is god of social unity, of society's law, rather than cosmic law. Like Deus Pater, he is a god of oaths, since society's continued existence relies on kept promises. He is a god of peace and prosperity, which he promotes as a god of exchange, of the circulation of goods. Perhaps unexpectedly, Haryamain is also a god of healing. This is because in Indo-European thought, health is the normal state of things, so a god of human normality is just the god to return someone to health. Haryamain is a good patron for financiers, doctors, peace advocates, negotiators, emergency workers, and anyone who works in society's infrastructure, such as garbage workers, road workers, plumbers, etc. Perkunos is either the striker or the oak god. He is found in some traditions as the thunder god, under names such as Taranus and Thor, which would come from the Proto-Indo-European Tochuns. Perkunos is the god of the thunderstorm. As such, he has two main sides. First, he is a warrior or champion god. In this role, he is the main figure in the best-preserved Proto-Indo-European myth, the dragon-killing myth. In this story, a hero kills a serpent who usually has three or more heads, using an aerial weapon. In some versions, he's helped by a human. The death of the serpent results in the release of waters, cows, and or women. This is a myth of both cosmic creation, since the serpent is preventing the growth of the world, and societal creation, since the serpent is preventing the free flow of wealth, like a dragon sitting on a hoard of gold. 
Pekunas' other main function is as a god of agriculture. He brings the fertilizing rains and releases the withheld waters. His weapon is the wagros, the smasher, the thunderbolt. In the descended traditions, this shows up as a club, an axe, a spear, an iron rod, arrows, flaming arrows, or a rock, in most cases, thrown. Perkonos is connected with bulls. His chariot is pulled by bulls. Bulls are sacrificed to him, or he is called a bull. He's also connected with goats. This may be because of his all-around virility, highly sexed, and a glutton. Perkonos is a good patron for farmers, herders, soldiers, military pilots, meteorologists, and astronomers, and is a good deity to pray to for protection in general. The Dewos Sanu are the sons of God, that is, of Duspater. Their most famous descendants are the Greco-Roman Castor and Pollux and the Vedic Ushvins. They are closely connected with horses. Ushvin, in fact, means horsemen. They might even appear in the descendant traditions in the form of a horse, as in the colt born on the same day as Pradari in the Welsh Mabinogi. The Dewosinu are twins, but they aren't identical in nature. One is more peaceful and connected with cattle, while the other is more warlike and more closely connected with horses. Together, they're connected with stars and boats. Because of this, they are considered saviors to those in distress at sea. In fact, they are savior gods in general. They are perhaps the closest of the Proto-Indo-European deities to mankind. The Ashvins, for instance, were so close to humanity that the other gods considered them to be unclean and barred them from the Soma sacrifice. As well as being the sons of Duspater, the Devosanu are the brothers and or lovers or husbands of the solar goddess I'll be talking about later. The Devosanu are good gods for breeders and riders of horses, armored troops, military pilots, sailors, healers, and anyone in distress. Hakom Nepot is the close relative of the waters. He is the god connected with the fiery water mystery that's one of the central aspects of Proto-Indo-European religion. This fiery water is in a well that Hakom Nepot guards. One of his descendants, the Irish Nechton, has such a well from which only he and his cupbearers can drink. His wife, Bowen, decides to drink some of its waters, either out of pride or to prove that she hasn't cheated on her husband. She has, however. Furthermore, she goes around the well counterclockwise, which is the wrong direction to circumambulate anything sacred. As a result, the well overflows and chases her to the sea, burning away an eye, a hand, and a thigh, creating the river Boyne in the process. It is this fire-water mixture that's reflected in the Proto-Indo-European sacred drink, the Nectar, overcomer of death. Chakwam Nippot's power is vast, encompassing all the areas of Proto-Indo-European thought. However, he only grants it to those who are morally and ritually pure and who approach it in the proper ritual manner. You must deserve it if you want to access it, or your attempts can lead to disaster. Yamos and Manos are another set of twins. They're involved in one of the Proto-Indo-European creation myths. Manos, whose name means man, sacrifices and dismembers Yamos, twin, and from the parts forms the world, the sky from his skull, the waters from his blood, the plants from his hair, and so on. Yamos literally becomes the world. His soul, however, goes to the land of the dead. As its first inhabitant, he becomes its king and the guide to the souls of future dead. Manos, as the conductor of the first sacrifice, is the first priest. Although his actions continue to guide us in rituals, he himself passes out of story and cult. The ironic thing is that Yamos, who was killed, continues to live as an immortal god, while Manos, who thought to remain alive, disappears. Yamos isn't necessarily a god who would be anyone's patron, unless maybe morticians, but his worship is part of funeral rituals. Pachuson is the protector or the shepherd. Like his descendant Pan, he is a god of herds, especially of goats. This makes him a god of wealth. Since he lives in the area outside towns, but not quite in the wild, Pachuson is a god of the in-between. Combining this with his connection with wealth makes him a god of merchants who travel carrying their goods. Both Pan and Pachuson's Vedic descendant, Pushan, are connected with sexuality. Perhaps this is a case of going between, or perhaps it is from his connection with the proverbially randy goat. Pachuson is a good god for all go-betweens, such as diplomats, negotiators, and merchants. He is also appropriate for those looking for general prosperity and protection. Menos is the moon. His name means measurer. He gets this name because he measures the sky and space in the month and time. Menos may be part of the intrigue between the Dewosanu and the sun goddess, is either a successful or unsuccessful suitor. He's also connected with healing, perhaps because the moon dies and is then reborn. Menos wasn't an important deity in Proto-Indo-European worship, 
but would be a good patron for healers, mathematicians, astronomers, and anyone looking for help in reasoning something out. It's more difficult to reconstruct Proto-Indo-European goddesses, but we can reconstruct some. Akwona means horse goddess. Her most famous descendant is probably the goddess Epona, whose name is a direct reflex. Akwona is a goddess of sovereignty. She provided this by mating with the king. She has identified with the land, so the king is married to his kingdom. She is also, however, a goddess of unrestrained sexuality. Or perhaps it might be said that she is restrained only by her own desires and that these desires are voracious. Akwona is also connected with the Proto-Indo-European sacred drink and with alcoholic drinks in general. The name of one of her Irish descendants, Medhav, in fact, means drunken or drunkenness. Like alcohol and sex, she has both a benevolent side and a malevolent one. It could also be said that she possesses great but dangerous power and that she must be dealt with carefully and properly. If this isn't done, then disaster can be expected. In general, she's not a fun goddess and is perhaps better propitiated than invoked. That said, she's an appropriate goddess for rulers as well as for sex workers and brewers. Wawinda, whose name means provider of cows, isn't so much a particular deity as a type of deity. She is the type of Indo-European goddess who is the mother of marriage and prosperity kind. Some Indo-European peoples had more than one cow goddess, and it's possible that the Proto-Indo-Europeans did as well. Gwawinda might have been the name of one of them, though, or at least a title. Gwawinda is connected with all the parts of Proto-Indo-European society, but especially with those involving fertility, prosperity, and health. Her status as goddess of marriage throws the adultery of the Irish cow goddess Boen into special relief and helps explain the severity of her punishment. Gwawinda is a patron for mothers, women who are pregnant or want to be, farmers, and anyone seeking peace and prosperity. Chausos is the best reconstructed of the Proto-Indo-European goddesses, appearing in a large number of Indo-European cultures, as Eos, Aurora, Ushas, Ashrina, and perhaps Elstra. She appears as a beautiful maiden, clad in the pinks and reds of the dawn sky. She has an erotic side. The Rig Veda often refers to her bearing her breasts. Despite this, and even though she brings back the welcome light, she is not completely beneficent. We see her danger indirectly in the Greek story of Eos and her mortal lover, Tithonus. Eos asks Zeus to give Tithonus eternal life, but forgets to ask for eternal youth. So he continues to age until he has to be shut up in a room, senile and powerless. Why should Chalsos be so dangerous? The Rig Veda puts it well. Ushas causes the mortal to age and wear away his lifespan as a cunning gambler carries away the stakes. Or as another text puts it, unaging, you make everything else age. You see, even though dawn is born again each morning, young and beautiful, we are not. Each day is one less we will get to live. Nevertheless, she does bring back light when things were dark, and for that we are grateful. Our lives may grow ever shorter, but she fills them with beauty. Chalsos is also goddess of spring, the dawn of the year. One of her attributes is the birch tree, one of the first to leaf in the spring, and white and pure. She is also connected with the life-giving cow. All in all, Chalsos is an ambivalent goddess, bringing both life and death. But her return each day is a sign of the workings of the Chatos and of all that implies. Chalsos might be prayed to at dawn and in the spring, in praise and in thanks for her gift of light, and with the hope that the life left to us may be vibrant and strong. Sawal Yoshio Dukater is the daughter of the sun. She is the sister of the Dewolf Sanu, so sun here refers to Dewspater. In some of the descendant traditions, she has become confused with either Kwona or Chalsos, and there may have been some overlap in Proto-Indo-European times. Sawal Yoshio Dukater is connected with weddings, but the marriages of her reflexes rarely go well, or at least unusual. The Welsh Kigva is separated from her husband Praderi soon after the wedding, for instance, and we all know the trouble Helen caused. Most unusual is that she may end up as the wife of the Dewos Sanu. With all this, she is still a patron of weddings and may be prayed to to bless them. She is therefore a patron of marrying couples, especially of brides. Donu is a river goddess who, in some of her descended forms, especially in the West, becomes an earth goddess or the ancestor of a people. Thus, we have the Irish people of Danu, the Greek Danaeans, and the Danes. Her name appears in the Eastern river names Danube, Don, Dniester, Dnieper, and Donuts. Because she is a water goddess, Donu is a giver of fertility. This may have been how she came to be connected with the earth. Donu would be a good patron for farmers and for freshwater sailors. 
As an ancestral goddess, she may be called upon to watch over an entire people. West Jaw is the goddess of the hearth. Although she is found widely, we can't reconstruct a Proto-Indo-European name for her. This is probably because she wasn't strongly personified, being the actual fire on the hearth. Myths surrounding her are scarce. Because of all this, I reconstructed my own name for her, from the root Hues to dwell, or from Hues to burn. Fire is the ultimate in purity. In fact, one of the Proto-Indo-European words for fire, Pachar, may be related to the root Pur, purify. The hearth is therefore to be protected from impurities. Hesiod, for instance, tells us not to expose ourselves to fire after sex, often considered a polluting activity. Hearth and home is, in Indo-European terms, redundant. The hearth is the home, and one cannot have a home without a hearth. When Herodotus wants to count families, it is hearth that he counts. It is by lighting a hearth fire that an Indo-European takes possession of land. Proto-Indo-European hearths were tended by the wife and mother. We see here how in the patriarchal Proto-Indo-European society, territory was owned by the husband of the woman who tended its hearth. This sheds light on why the fires of Breed, Vesta, and Hestia were all tended by unmarried women. These were the hearths of the land. In this way, no one man controlled the entire land. It also explains why the Vedic Garhapati Agni, which represents the hearth and rituals, is tended by the wife of the sacrificer, who is lord of the sacrificial ground. West Jaw might be prayed to by homeowners to protect their home. She is best worshipped at a hearth, which these days would be a stove. Appropriate offerings to her are portions of the household meals. Dekyo Mater is the Earth Mother. She may not have been Proto-Indo-European in origin, but she was still worshipped by the Proto-Indo-Europeans. She is a goddess of the fertile earth. Among the Slavs, she's moist mother earth. One title or name for her is Pultwi, the broad one, that is, the one who extends widely. This describes the fields or the steppes, but it also describes her from the point of view of the worshiper. She is not a goddess of the whole earth, just of the part personally known to the people worshiping her. As a goddess of fertility, Degul Mater is often identified with cows. A common offering to her, however, was a sow, in part because they are especially prolific. Degul Mater may be a patron for anyone who works with the earth or life, such as farmers, biologists, and environmentalists. Kolios is the coverer. The land of the dead is ruled by a god, Yamos, but death itself is a goddess who drags people away with a noose or snare. She isn't a deity one would want to have a relationship with, so offerings to her are apotropaic, asking that she keep away, and are given over to her completely, with no part of them being shared by the offerer. She is not an appropriate patron, even for those who work with death. These are the Proto-Indo-European deities which can be confidently reconstructed. Others may look behind deities from the descended traditions without our being able to identify them as Proto-Indo-European, and there are probably many who left no trace in our records. Again, if you want to know more about Proto-Indo-European religion, including my sources, you can consult my book, Deep Ancestors, or my website, both of which also have rituals you can use to worship these deities. Information is in the descriptions. So now I bid you, Ate Dewobis, go with the gods. Thank you.